I just want to say thank you to everyone who's making this happen. Um, uh, the School of Music, Theater, and Dance with Dean Racine, um, Mark Clegg, who is our editor-in-chief, um, UMS, um, the Gershwin uh, family, Mike Stredsky and Mark George Gershwin are here, um, and, and all of our speakers. I'm just so, so very glad this is happening. I want to give a special shout out to our assistants in the Gershwin office who this wouldn't be happening without them. So thank you, everyone, and here we go. So I'll start off this panel um, by introducing everyone fairly quickly, and then uh, each of you will have um, uh, five to ten minutes to talk about the topic that you wish to cover today. Um, we're going to start with uh, Rich Crawford. Uh, he's a native of Detroit. Um, he was the Hans T. David Distinguished Professor of Musicology Emeritus at the University of Michigan. So he's kind of the, the father uh, Americanist musicologist to many of us um, over in the School of Music. Uh, he's adding to the 10 books he has published on music in the United States, um, including America's Musical Life, A History. Uh, during the summer of 2019, W.W. Norton will bring out a new biography that he's written, and it's Summertime, Gershwin's Life in Music. <coughs> so we're very much looking forward to that. William Bochum, uh, he, <laughs> He has won the National Medal of Arts, the Pulitzer Prize, and a Grammy Award um, for his, his compositions. Uh, he's an American composer of keyboard, chamber, operatic, vocal, choral, and symphonic music. Uh, he joined the faculty of the University of Michigan School of Music in 1973. He was the Ross Lee Finney Distinguished University Professor of Composition, uh, and he retired after 35 years with us, and uh, his legacy still lives on. Um, especially uh, in his collaborations with our, our performers at the School of Music in um, 2005, uh, his recording of Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience on the Naxos label uh, won four Grammy Awards. Joan Morris uh, is a mezzo-soprano, and she's concertized with her husband, Bill Bolcom, um, singing popular songs from the late 19th century through the 20s and 30s. Um, the latest songs uh, by Lieber and Stoller. And she also uh, has some cabaret songs, um, both by Bolcom and the uh, poet uh, Arnold Weinstein. Um, she has taught for a long time a cabaret class at the School of Music here at the university. And in 2004, she was a soloist in the uh, performance of Songs of Innocence and Experience. And on their travels throughout the United States, Canada and abroad, uh, Joan and Bill um, frequently give master classes uh, focusing on classic American popular song. Uh, Bill Barkheimer is from Pennsylvania, currently residing in Munich, Germany. Um, he is a conductor uh, who works with uh, um, productions in Europe of Porgy and Bess, Showboat, Carmen Jones, and Sophisticated Ladies. He has a long history with Porgy and Bess, and so we're very excited to have him here uh, looking at our score and experiencing this with us. Wayne Shirley, as we've said, is the editor of the Porgy and Bess Critical Edition. I don't know what much more needs to be said except that he's been a joy to work with and he's extremely detailed and um, we're very excited um, that he's here to share this with us and to help us make this happen. Uh, he said, he told me to tell you guys that he's made it through act two of the errata and the only person who knows what that means is Andy Kohler. Um, <laughs> And then, of course, we have Mark George Gershwin. And Mark George, Mark is, um, he is the head of the George Gershwin Family Trust. Um, he's a huge supporter of the Gershwin Initiative. He's one of the reasons that this happened here at the University of Michigan. Uh, they support us uh, financially and spiritually and um, really help us make all of this, this happen. And so we're so glad that he's here. Uh, and the same with Michael Strensky. He's, Ira and uh, Lee Gershwin's nephew, and he's the trustee of Ira's musical estate. Um, he is, I am pleased to say, also very proud of the five Broadway shows brought to fruition since he's been around. Um, he has a great relationship with the University of Michigan, and we are blessed um, with the help that we've received with him uh, in making the uh, Gershwin Initiative such a success. So all of that said, we'll go ahead and get started, and we will start with Rich Crawford. Rich, do you have a microphone? You're good. I do. Thank you very much. You should have in your folder uh, a sheet that says George Gershwin, born in Brooklyn, and so forth. And that's, um, as a biography of, of Gershwin, 
uh, as a biographer of Gershwin. Yeah. How's that? Uh, now you can. I was just kind of clearing my throat here. Um, as, a, as a biographer of, of Gershwin, I decided that uh, uh, the best thing that I could do for this event would be to give a, uh, what I've learned about how Porgy and Bess came, uh, came to be. And so what I've given you there in your uh, uh, packet is a timeline of the various uh, aspects of his, of his uh, life uh, that have, in my view, uh, something to do with Porgy and Bess. Um, one thing uh, that is worth remembering is that Gershwin, as, as you're looking down this chronology, uh, keep in mind that he was one year and three months older than the 20th century. And so that would give you a sense of how old he was when he did such and such an activity. And uh, keep in mind that this is a composer who lived his life as a young composer. Um, what I've decided to do, uh, I'm not going to read through these items. You can, you can check that one out for yourselves. Um, uh, but I, uh, I, I've, I've, I've got about five or six brief takeaways that you will understand as you go through and look through these various steps. Uh, the first thing to remember, I think, was is that Gershwin was a, a pianist before he was a composer. And the first good teach, their teacher that he uh, uh, began to work with on the piano uh, introduced and who introduced him to Chopin and Debussy, encouraged his pupil's inclination to rag the classics. In other words, the play, when you played the piano, uh, when Gershwin played the piano, he had a predilection from pretty early in his life to play it his own way. Uh, he, was a, he was very much uh, taken by popular music at the time. He was learning classical music, but he, he had his own way of, piano, of uh, playing the piano. And for this, with Hambitzer, he didn't get his knack knuckles swatted. Uh, rather, he was encouraged to go ahead and do it how, however he wanted to. One thing you will note, uh, I think, uh, it, from the uh, from the log that, from the timeline that I've put out here is that from 1919 uh, to 1933, um, Gershwin composed the scores of 25 musical comedies, comedies, none of which are cited on this on this timeline, that he was known as a composer of, of Broadway shows, and he was very successful and persistent in doing this work, and was one of the leading people in the Broadway theater. But that's up, up in the background of all this, and you don't see it on, on, my, uh, on, my, on my list. You'll notice uh, 1920 so it writes his first blues song. Um, 1922, he wrote a, an, uh, a, a, an operatic sketch, sketch for a Broadway show 
for uh, which purported to be a legend of African American musicians and players and so forth. So he was very interested in Af African American music really from the beginning and then continued. Um, in 1924, he composed the Rhapsody in Blue, um, which was an instant hit and Well, you could, you could say it's one of the works that was, uh, one of the few works that was a, a hit from the moment it uh, uh, surfaced. And uh, this classic, uh, instant classic, you could say, was a a, a very important reason for, uh, for him to become a famous man in America by 1924 or 1925. That is, he, he lived his, his latter, the latter part of his life as a celebrity. And he was, a very, he was the kind of musician who was in the, in the press. Uh, and and uh, that's a, a, an important thing to keep in mind about, about him. Um, if, you, if you look at the, at the um, sheet that I've uh, passed around to you, you'll see that in, in 1927, he, well, he, he, uh, he read, a, uh, well, ac actually, I should, uh, I don't want to get too d deeply in the weeds uh, on, on this, this too much, but in, in 1924, uh, a New York patron by the name of Otto Kahn offered to fund and uh, well, to fund a jazz opera. And he invited three people to uh, volunteer to, to perform it, uh, to, to write it. Uh, they were Jerome Kern, Irving Berlin, and George Gershwin. Both Kern and Berlin opted out, and then and they said, Publicly, they they were not up to it. They they did not have the skills that would allow a person to do, to to write a, a, a an opera. Gershwin, on the other hand, said he'd be very interested. And then, within that uh, the next several months, he wrote a, a column in which he announced that he would love to do a jazz opera as long as it would have a Negro cast and that it could be performed in a Broadway theater. Uh, that's the combination was rather a strange idea at the time. But as, as you know, the, the way things turned out, uh, that's that's it tur turned out to be Bor Porgy and Bess. Shortly after that, Gershwin re read a, a novel by the name of, of uh, a Porgy by a white Southern, Cal uh, Southern Cal Carolina uh, author, DuBose Hayward. He, he, he read the opera and he thought this would be exactly the kind of thing that he would write the kind of op opera he had in mind uh, to, uh, well, he, he, he and, and he got in touch with David, with Hayward. 
And Hayward thought it sounded like a good idea. They didn't know each other. They got together. Uh, they hit it off. And then Gershwin announced, well, let's do that. And when I'm ready, when I'm equipped to do, to tackle the composition of the opera, uh, let's do it. Well, you can see from the, <laughs> from the list here, that that turned out to be about seven years. And uh, so that, that the, the details of that can be found in, uh, in, uh, on, on your sheet. Um, did I just hear a bill, bell go off on me? <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. Um, I, I would, uh, I would, Finish up. Oh, one more, th one more thing about the, uh, uh, the 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 division of labor on the writing of this piece. Uh, Hayward did the libretto of the show. Gershwin wrote the music, and Ira wrote, oh, um, Hayward, who was a poet, also wrote some lyrics, too. But Gershwin's partner in crime as a songwriter was, of course, Ira. And Ira was, was a master of, he was a master of the Broadway of the musical comedy uh, type of, of, of song. And Hayward was a poet of African-American music in a more serious vein in the culture of the, of the South. And in writing the score of, of Porgy and Bess, George composed things of both kinds, and Ira I was listening last night. Uh, suddenly we got, I got plenty of nothing. Well, that's an Ira special. That's, that's the, much more the uh, type of song that you get from, uh, from Ira. And he did that, and Hayward did much of the other things. Well, I'm, I'm going to wind up here by by saying that you, you see uh, from your, your uh, timeline here that from 1933 up in October till the premiere in 1935, it was two years. And Gershwin spent that entire amount of time working only on on Porgy and Bess. Um, and which, which is much longer than he labored over any uh, project ever in his life before. And kind of as a reminder of all this, um, and this is my sign off line, uh, Gershwin devoted two years to the making of Porgy and Bess, uh, a tale about black people whom he realized early in life were the Americans whose history, music, musicality, and mimetic skills were best suited for the operatic stage. Thanks for your attention. to move to Bill Botham and Joan Morris, and we'll let them share the mic as they will. Thank you. Um, we were lucky enough to know the songwriter Kay Swift, who was Gershwin's girlfriend and lover for a time. Um, we were introduced to her by Robert Kimball, 
Uh, Bill, when I met him, was collaborating on a book about UB Blake with Robert Kimball called Reminiscing with Cecil and Blake. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know what occasioned it, but he just took us and introduced us to Kay. Kay, from the very beginning, she was like UB. He would start teaching you the minute you were in his presence. We did one of his songs and I remember him saying to us, you need a better ending, you know, so you'd work on that. And Kay would tell us whatever song we picked of George Gershwin's, she would say, oh no, she says, you've got to, do the original tempo from the 1920s. She felt that during the Second World War, a lot of people, when they performed songs, they slowed the tempos down. And so we were lucky enough to hear from her, this was the tempo that George did it. Um, she also told us about being at opening night of Porgy and Bess on Broadway. She said she was sitting between George and Ira, and when um, John Bubbles came out on stage as Sport and Life, he had bought a new, um, jumpsuit and the zipper stuck and so he had to do his performance kind of you know facing away from the audience she said she remembered putting a hand on Iris and one on George's arm she was so shocked you know but he, but he got through the number it all went well and years later Bill and I were part of a show was it a town hall oh yeah um, yeah we were part of a show Black Broadway, and in that particular show was Ad Adelaide Hall, legendary singer, and John Bubbles, who'd had a stroke, but he still performed. They wheeled him out on a kind of a cart with wheels, and he took his hat, and he led the audience in a kind of a call and response of, he'd sing, it ain't necessarily so, and everybody out there would sing, it ain't necessarily so, marvelous thing. And afterwards, there was a kind of a cafe in the town hall, which we sat there and talked with them till 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning of the reminiscences between Bubbles and uh, also, of course, Adelaide Hall, who was very close to all these people. And it was an amazing time. I think one of the things that uh, we, we basically have to tell you is that we found a few things. Uh, Rich, I don't know that, uh, that you know that the, the piano that the Gershwin family bought was supposed to be for Ira. <laughs> and, uh, and that in the end, the, uh, of course, it was George who took to it. And, uh, Many years ago, uh, I was at the Coolidge Auditorium, and they were talking. It was about a, about a Gershwin um, festival, and they were trying. I think the Gershwin estate to try to act as if the last song, which he didn't complete, was of course the "I Love Is Here to Stay." All we have is 16 bars of it in Gershwin's hand, just as a kind of a lead sheet, and the rest was quite clearly not finished by Ira, who couldn't read music or anything but of course by Vernon Duke, with whom I was working on a show. And the first, for example, was all pretty much Vernon Duke. You could talk by internal. I know both people's work quite well. It was quite clear that there was a lot of Dukey and harmonic changes that make it quite clear it wasn't. And I remember the Gershwin people's faces fell, as I said this, because they were trying to prove that Gershwin, and both Gershwins that had this thing, and that would have allowed them to have a longer copyright, but I'm afraid, I said by internal evidence, it definitely was by, by and also, uh, Bernard Duke's uh, widow was there, and she confirmed the same thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, I want to add one thing. Um, uh, Kay uh, told us that a lot of people doubted that Gershwin had actually done the orchestration for Porgy and Bess, because they knew him for doing the popular songs. She said she was there when he was working on a lot of that, uh, of the orchestration. She observed him doing the work. Is um, it, is this yeah, and uh, also she told us that they had a wonderful time in, in bed, but he never stayed overnight. It never got, <laughs> yeah, it never got to toothbrush time. And, and when Bill told that story to Arnold Weinstein, his collaborator Arnold said, that's a song. And he wrote a song called <laughs> Toothbrush Time. <laughs> this girl had, you know, had, uh, had invited this young man to stay overnight with her. And the morning, she's trying to get rid of him. <laughs> you know, what do you do? So it's kind of the thing, you know, the old joke, of course, is the best lover is around. It turns into a pizza at 4 a.m. Well, he hadn't done that. <laughs> so, uh, that's, uh, but, but Kay was a delightful, fun, funny person. Uh, Michael Feinstein, who was in the days we knew him, mostly known as a scholar. He was also secretary for Harry Warren and for Ira Gershwin. And then, of course, he became a kind of a star of his own. I didn't know that he was going to do that. But uh, I, he used to imitate Kay wonderfully on the phone. Hello! And I said, hi, Kay. You know, it's Michael. <laughs> <laughs> she always talked just like that all the time. You know, she, and she was always made up to the absolute nines. I had never seen a more elegant lady. And she was such fun to be with, a wonderful musician. She'd written a couple of standards. Uh, 
Uh, yes, yes. Can this be love? Can we be friends? Uh, Find a dandy? Uh, and, uh, other wonderful songs. In fact, years ago, uh, Bill DeYoung here at the school decided to have a choreography of, um, of several of, uh, of, of Kay's songs, which Joan then sang and I played the piano for, and then uh, Bill choreographed, and Kay came out, and she stayed with us. We have a picture of her together with us at our house. And she was the most marvelous. So I think the most scholarly thing I can say is that she gave the tempos. When I did my solo piano Gershwin album, she gave me the tempos. She actually wrote out some of the shorter pieces by memory because Gershwin had played them and never bothered to write them down. And uh, there's, there's a little, uh, little blues and two keys, which the uh, right hand is in C and the, right, the left hand is in D. Kay wrote that out and I played it and recorded it. And uh, first rate musician, an absolute delightful person. That's pretty much all we have to say as far as college <laughs> scholars. I think we actually, and of course, through her, we met the Emily Strunsky. Was Michael Strunsky here? Yeah. And so, is that, is that your mom? No, that was my aunt. That was your aunt? Yes. I don't think I've met you before, but I remember no, all right. No, I've not met you. No, and uh, Mabel Shermer, of course, was a few of those. So we got to know all the people who have been around, uh, you know, that the, the those are still surviving. And it was a delightful thing to find out, and it gave me a real insight. And when it came to recording that thing, I had Kay right there at the recording sessions. So uh, it's as close to, as, as I could make, to the version of tempo and style. I, I have a little thank for that. Thank you both. And now we'll move on to um, Bill Barkheimer, actually. He's, he's going to take it up from there. Good morning. So I was going to just speak and uh, off the cuff and I decided last night I made a better write something out otherwise I'll just ramble on. There's so much to say one hardly knows where to begin. But I was asked to speak about my involvement uh, in the changes in performance practice over time and the other subject was the reception history in the years I've been performing for the Invest. So maybe I'll start with that. Um, for the Invest, of course my experience is mainly in Europe since I've lived there ever since I finished school in the United States and went to Vienna to study. In fact, I had never, uh, my only experience with Poirier Invest was the LP at home when I was a child of the uh, movie soundtrack, which was actually orchestrated not by Gershwin, but by Previn. So I heard Poirier Invest for the first time when I was studying in Vienna. It was performed at the uh, Volkshochschule. And uh, it was a black cast of uh, soloists with their own house white chorus, of course. But the uh, artistic director, the person who brought for you, was Marcel Brock. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll do this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, please uh, interrupt me or add anything that anyone has to say if I may make, may make some mistakes in uh, my history and so forth. Um, so, getting back to Marcel Pravi, he was the, uh, he had left Vienna before the war and he came back to Vienna as part of the uh, U.S. Army uh, in charge of culture and uh, then he became uh, a production manager at the Volksoper. He brought Kiss Me Kate, first of all. He was just, from his experience in the United States, he was uh, enthralled with musicals and with Gershwin especially, bringing then his his dream was to do Porgy and Bess, and he was finally able to do that, and got the money to bring in uh, black Americans for the soloists. Uh, uh, I have a quote from him that I think sums up, uh, it's a wonderful quote actually, I'll, I translated it in English, I hope I did a fairly decent translation of it. Marcel probably said, if one accepts my definition, although his, his definition of opera, a certain definition, whereby opera has a theme that moves the heart and with melodies that automatically live further in the heart, if one accepts that definition, then Porgy and Bess is really the last opera that was composed. <laughs> the street along which included Zauberflöte, Traviata, Meistersinger, Cavalleria, Rosenkavalier, then that street really ends with Porgy and Bess. I thought it's a wonderful, uh, I think in Europe, uh, Porgy and Bess, there's a, uh, a Gershwin, in general, but especially Porgy and Bess, there's a better uh, appreciation of it than in the United States, or at least there was sooner uh, the appreciation of what Porgy and Bess really is and what it means, and that Gershwin really was 
Uh, certainly, in my estimation, the greatest American composer, and Porgy and Gus is certainly the greatest American opera, and will remain that. Um, so that that was wonderful for me to it was strange for me to, as an American, to to get to know Gershwin in uh, in Europe. As a matter of fact, it, uh, my uh, diploma uh, got a diploma in Vienna, and at the concert uh, that we had to give at the end, the teacher asked me to. Uh, gave, assigned me to conduct American in Paris. And I said, uh, oh, well, I didn't come to Europe to, I came to, to, to Europe to Vienna to study uh, uh, European music, not American music. And so I ended up with conducting the uh, Freischutz Overture, which uh, <laughs> isn't nearly as interesting or as long as an American in Paris. I'd have probably had the longest uh, uh, thing in the program with American in Paris. But I was too young to know better back then. <laughs> Uh, so I am rambling here. <laughs> I'm not totally off script. Uh, getting back to the uh, reception history, my experience has been that the most enthusiastic audiences uh, in Europe, are, it's all the audiences in Europe are enthusiastic with Porgy and Bess. The Italians are probably more reserved, especially the open night audience, even for their own Italian operas. Uh, but the German audiences in general, I think, are the most enthusiastic. And I will say we performed last year in Tel Aviv, and they were very similar to a German audience in their enthusiasm and how they, uh, with their applause, how they reacted, and the uh, curtain calls and all that sort of thing. Um, what has changed over time is that uh, the German critics, especially the German critics, now have think that uh, we, our production is a traditional production. And the German critics think that the, the story is really, they only think of it as a story about race. And uh, they feel that our production, a traditional production, uh, doesn't, um, is lacking in what they call social critique, social criticism. Um, so we run into that an awful lot, the, not from the public, it's always in the press. I think. Uh, the press is, uh, well, reviewers get tired of saying the same old thing. We know that from the United States, too. I suppose. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting away from the microphone. Um, and there are other aspects that I'll let uh, Mark and Mike talk about later, about uh, the change in uh, when Europeans pr present their own productions of Boy and Bess, of uh, how European directors present it. So that's another story in itself that I'll leave to them. And I will go on about the performance practice, which is also a very involved thing. Um, it's a difficult subject to begin with because George composed Poggy and Bess as an opera, and that ended up being given in a Broadway theater that didn't have a pit, uh, well, obviously bigger than the Broadway pits today. They pit, uh, as Wayne was telling me, there were 43 musicians in the pit. 43. 40, 43 which we consider today uh, an absolute minimum. I think I had, when we performed in Amsterdam at the Carré Theater, there wasn't room for more than 43. And uh, that's really an absolute minimum of what you have. But George would have been thrilled, I'm sure, to hear it performed by a larger orchestra than the way it can be done in opera houses in the United States and Europe today. And you'll hear it tomorrow night, of course, in a concert version with a, with a full orchestra. Of, I think I saw 12 first violins up there. and. <laughs> and of course the full wind section. At the end of the uh, Broadway run, they even reduced it uh, already towards the end, Wayne said, before they went on the tour. Uh, they reduced the, orchestra the orchestration, in fact, they, and the string section. There was one clarinet less. There was the two was left out, I think. The two was left out. It, was, it went from three horns. Three horns to two horns, and maybe three, three a trumpet. trumpet to two yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Um, out of necessity, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Wayne, could you take the mic, please? Okay. Uh, yeah, it was that or close the show, you know. And they basically almost halved the string section. They kept having two double basses for some reason. We know that because in the part, they, uh, the people, when, it, when it, the first production traveled and it got to, I think, Pittsburgh and the double, two but double bases signed as the Bohemian Twins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, no, I would always at least keep two double bases. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and yeah. there's been easy. There's a reason, too. Yeah, there's well, been easy. Well, if you have to have a small orchestra and you have all that extra bass. Microphone? Microphone? I better have that. <laughs> <laughs> if you have, a, have to do a small orchestration and, and uh, anybody who's involved with the stage, as I've been much of my life, I've also seen all of my operas, which were written for Lyric Opera, three of them anyway, before this last one from Minnesota. I had, a, I had to, by contract, to have 78 people because it's a 3,500 seat house. But in other places, I had to make, or had, had made, uh, 30 player reductions of, uh, say, the Youth on the Bridge and also a wedding because of the practicality, because most opera houses in the United States, the smaller ones in Virginia, only hold, or uh, the one that's, say, in Santa Barbara, can only hold 30 people in the, in the pit. Mm -hmm. And if you have extra double basses, the upper partials of those basses will make the string section sound bigger. That's why it's good to have two. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Close it, please. Okay. Yeah, we can swallow the mic. <laughs> I won't hold it. I did that in Hamburg on television last year, and and the uh, American sitting beside me finally took the mic out of my hand because I was talking <laughs> <laughs> and held it in front of me so that I wouldn't move around with it. Um, anyway, so in the 40s, then we know there was another uh, production. I don't know what the orchestration was. I'm sure it was a smaller orchestration, and much of the uh, Music was cut and uh, dialogue replaced the music. Uh, I don't know, I think then in 1952, that was also performed first, the State Department tour performed in New York first, right? <laughs> At the Ziegfeld Theater. And then it went uh, uh, all over Europe. Uh, Truman Capote even wrote a book about it, uh, in, in his book about it, or an entire book, I forget, about the performances in Russia. Um, there is a recording that just came up. We, I don't think we had a recording before, but they were found in the archives a couple years ago at the uh, state uh, radio in Berlin that had never been published. It was just sitting in the archives. Of, uh, and it's very interesting to hear what they did, what uh, Alexander Smolens, who was the conductor of the original 1935 Broadway production, what he did with it in 1952, which was changed a lot of things, and I'm sure Tempe were different than what they had been in 1935. People tend to, I've experienced that before, people involved in original productions who don't have the final say necessarily, when they get on their own, they think they know better than the original. <laughs> I, I had made that mistake one time when we did Sophisticated Ladies. I hired someone to direct it who had been in the original chorus, thinking that we would get the original Broadway production, but uh, he had other ideas. <laughs> um, so going on from, uh, it's the recording I uh, recommended just out of, out of history to hear what they did with it. Uh, that it is, a lot of liberties were taken. Uh, but it was still with the, it was backed with, the, uh, with uh, the music, not dialogue for the most part. Then came the Ella Gerber production, which I never heard. I've just heard a lot of talk about it and I've had singers that joined us later, who had been in the Ella Gerber production, she added a lot of written out ad libs put into the score, and we could never get those ad libs out of the singers that had been in that production. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know about the Ella Gerber production? No, no, no. But no one's seen it. She, was, right. she was a musical comedy person. Microphone? She was a musical comedy person, not an opera person. Yeah. So, uh, but as I said before, my first uh, experience with it was, was in Vienna. And the folks over not only did uh, Pravi bring over uh, American singers, he brought over uh, Lee Shane, an American conductor. He brought over Nat Merrill, an American stage director, who later staged also the first Metropolitan Opera production. Um, and the Porgy was Bill Warfield, who had been in the uh, State Department tour in the 50s. And that made a huge impression on me. I could go on and tell a lot more about it, but I'll move on to uh, my next Porgy and Bess was uh, first seeing the Houston Goldman production of Porgy and Bess. The Houston Opera in 1976, I think it was, brought uh, Porgy back uh, for US audiences as the original opera 
version of the full version without not without the Yellow Gerber and Ibs, without the <laughs> small orchestration and so forth. Uh, and later I conducted that production in Paris and Palermo. Um, it did had a chorus, that's another subject of how large not just the orchestra but also the chorus. Back then it was considered uh, even by Houston 32 and the chorus seemed like a big chorus. Today John Demain, who was the conductor of that production and I both feel that 32 is an absolute minimum if you're going to do Porgy and Bess in an opera house as an opera. And when we perform it and when I perform it in Europe we go with uh, try to have at least 40 or 42 in the chorus. No when they did it in Chicago at the insistence of the Chicago Opera, they had 50 in the chorus, which was almost, at the Metropolitan Opera, they had a huge in the huge chorus. It was almost, the chorus was fantastic. Yes. But it was really fantastic. But the old production was overblown, in my opinion. And we're all curious to see what the new Metropolitan Opera production will be like. Um, so, let me see. Uh, the various opera, German opera house productions, it was uh, until the around the beginning of the 80s. They were doing their own productions like Vienna, but some of them not, even with white uh, soloists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I've saw it with white soloists even painted black, and uh, <laughs> which was, uh, thank God that's not, uh, that's not permitted anymore. Uh, even Gertz Friedrich, who, move on, okay, I'll just say, and then some of the things I have to say why Mark and uh, Mike can pick up anyway. The Gertz Friedrich production was first also all white and uncut as far as I can remember, done in the Komische Oper in East Berlin during communism before he went to the West. And Mark and uh, uh, Mike can tell you, I'll, I'll let them tell you more about those productions. So I'll pass it over to, I think Wayne was the next. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That actually was really interesting. I'm so sorry to have to cut you short. That's okay. <laughs> Great history lesson. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we can ask him questions about that when we get to the Q&A. But um, next we're going to go with Wayne, who's going to talk a little bit about making the addition. That's right. Yeah. I'm an editor. I've been given five to ten minutes to talk, and believe me, ten minutes is too long to listen <laughs> to an editor. Uh, what I did was, let me tell you how, how the idea of the edition came around. I'll start. About 30 years ago, an English reviewer in uh, opera, the English magazine, which is the most respectable uh, English magazine about opera, said, reviewing an European production of Porgy and Bess, that uh, Porgy and Bess was perhaps the opera closest to the center of the repertory of which there was no published full score. That was 30 years ago. Uh, uh, 15 years ago, there was still no published full score. If you did Porgy and Bess, there was a rather good rental score. I was told there was a terrible set of parts, but I never saw that particular set of parts. But you could get, uh, I, I won't, you know, there were wonderful performances of Porgy and Bess, done from that rental score. But it was not in libraries, and it had never been edited the way, let's say, a Puccini opera, when they published the full score, and boy, they got the full scores of them out pretty fast, uh, uh, was, uh, was published with a full, uh, a full set of people who were used to publishing opera scores. I think I'd better go back a little bit. Full score equals score that not only has the singers and an accompaniment that the piano can play, it tells you what the second oboe is playing and what the trombones are playing and it gives you all the parts. And I'm habitually, I call that a full score. Uh, so please, please forgive it if that's the first time you've heard orchestra score called full score. Anyhow, uh, 
there were no, t uh, Ira, uh, in his, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, said to Robert Kimball, who was the advisor, uh, sort of music advisor for uh, the Gershwin estate and so forth, said to Robert Kimball, we must do right by Porgy and Bess because uh, there was no sort of official addition. Uh, there were the disputes broke out as to well, those ad libs you talked about, are they really a part of it? Uh, who really sings lines towards the end of the show where uh, traditionally uh, things uh, that were ascribed to Mingo uh, were suddenly taken by Mariah and the Mingo and the Mariah glared at each other. Um, and so, I was asked, finally, they chose me to make the addition. And what I did was I looked at the various sources, uh, most of them notes on paper, there was a nice typescript libretto, uh, and listened to recordings, early recordings as well. And I wrote the thing out afresh because you have to look at every single note. And I may, and the changes from the Porgy you know are minuscule. They're very small. Porgy and Bess is the same show. I like to think of what most editors do to things as you've been to a gallery and you've seen some wonderful pictures. Then you clean your glasses. <laughs> the changes are tiny, but they're there. And I thought I would mention three of the changes I made. Uh, first, the one I, first, the tiniest of them all, and it's the one I like to, to use as an example because I don't have to play the examples because it's just speaking. Uh, in the, in the piano vocal score, which is what you can buy now, and what everybody learns his or her part from, the mean old detective who comes in and tells Serena that unless her husband's body is buried within the day, within the week, I think, uh, uh, it will be taken to the medical students and, of course, dissected. And she is uh, that mean old detective. The second line he says to her is in the piano vocal score, <clears throat> and this is what you learn if you're the detective, and this is what you always say. He did not leave any burial insurance, which is awfully uh, formal for somebody who really hates this part of his job. Uh, and what what, what the, the libretto says, what the big sketch says, what the full score says is he didn't leave any burial insurance. And, you know, it's this tiny little speck. But, uh, you know, you, for one nanosecond, you hear him being formal to this woman who he thinks is basically a thing. And you wonder, and then you go back and, and listen to the show. But I cleaned up this, that tiny little thing, and I, I, it, you know, when it was in rehearsal, I don't even notice I did it, but I notice that the line is working a hell of a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing I'm going to tell you about is the most visible difference. And that is in Act Two, Scene One, a band comes marching in, a band that is supposed to represent a part of a Charleston, South Carolina history, the Jenkins Orphanage Band. You probably have all heard of the New Orleans Orphanage Band, which produced Louis Armstrong. Uh, but the Jenkins Orphanage Band was a very similar band in Charleston 
and it produced, uh, I hope some of you know the name Jabo Smith, a wonderful trumpeter, and some of you know the name Cat Anderson, uh, Duke Ellington's trumpeter who could play way higher than anyone else. Uh, and it was a part of Charleston life, and it was so much a part of Charleston life that when Porgy, the play, not the opera, the play that, that was opened in 1927 and which really gives Porgy and Bess its shape, the scenes of the play map into the scenes of the opera, they got the actual Charleston uh, Jenkins band to play and to march the people out to the picnic and to play at the picnic scene. And George wanted a band. <laughs> and George got a band. And when George first scored Act Two, Scene One, he wasn't sure he was going to be able to afford the band, and he wasn't able to, uh, quite able to do the mechanical weirdness you do in the score to have a band as well as the orchestra. It would take some time. Yeah, I, uh, two more minutes. Uh, and he will, um, and so he orchestrated it so it was safe without the band. And then when the whole score was scored, he scored the band. And somehow the music for the band got lost. And I could explain, explain you how, but then, then she would really give me the hope. Uh, and so after the first revival, there's never been a band on stage. And you'll see the band, it can't march on and off because the stage isn't big enough, but you, you, we will have the band. And, and, it, uh, and, you know, I'm so happy I got it back. But the thing I'm really happy I got back, everybody in this room knows Bess Hugh is my woman now. And if you went to a performance, you would uh, hear uh, Jake, say to Porgy to Por and Bess who are sitting there, Bess, come on along to the picnic. And then there's this beautiful little orchestral interlude uh, ending in a wonderful cello solo which winds down and finally gets into the key so Porgy can sing Bess, he was my woman now. But uh, in every source except the vocal score, Two things happen on stage by the singers. Porgy sings, and I'm going to back up on the microphone. You know, remember, Jake has just said, Bess, come on along to the picnic. Porgy sings, yes, Bess, I think you ought to go. And Bess says, not sings, if you ain't going, I ain't going. And Porgy sings, Bess, you is my woman now, and you must laugh and sing and dance for two instead of one. And, you know, what was a, a, what was a nice, nice, it comes into being a nice heart. Suddenly it's absolutely motivated. And that was one of the reasons I, that, I, uh, that I edited Porgy and Bess, is to get that back in. Thank you. to uh, Mark George Gershwin, uh, who has a few things to add, I think. Um, I microphone. Okay. <laughs> um, why is this being done Pull it closer, here? Mark. Why is the critical edition, critical edition being done? Why in Michigan? Um, this goes back to 1996. Uh, Mike Stronsky and I um, were in Bregenz, Austria, and Bregenz has this big opera festival every summer and Porgy and Bess was their featured opera. Um, Andrew Lytton uh, was the conductor. Andrew Lytton's parents went to high school with Mike. Andrew Lytton grew up a block from where I lived in Manhattan. Um, and we knew Andrew from uh, a Porgy and Bess concert that he had done in London. So here we're, we're in Bregenz, Austria, and Andrew says to Mike and I, 
these parts. They're horrible. You guys got to do something about the parts. I mean, Mike and I are not conductors. We know Porky and Bess had always been done. I mean, no one really complained. I mean, conductors would go in and mark it up and make their cuts. Anyway, we found out that these parts were horrible. Then we found out that the parts that were in New York by one rental agent were different than the parts that were being rented in London. So um, sometime after that, we sort of, first of all, we had to find out whose responsibility was this. Uh, did the rental people own the parts? Was it our responsibility? Uh, I mean, this, well, this took a few years to sort of sort out. Anyway, uh, at some point, uh, Wayne had, I guess, retired from the Library of Congress, and <laughs> we helped, so we said, would you do this? Mike actually said, would you take on the task of doing a critical edition? But we needed a whole apparatus at that point to do a, a critical edition. My middle son is a graduate from Michigan. He got in touch with the university, I guess with Mark. Uh, and that's how this whole genesis started. And here we are, how many years now? Like nine, I think. Nine years later, where it's finally ready. Uh, and even last night they were saying, they were going over things saying, is this right or wrong? I mean, in, in, you know, now that with computers it's easier, but everything was done by copyists. So it's easy to know why mistakes were made and why it you know, wasn't correct. Hopefully now this critical edition will be made into a performance edition and going forward, and probably we're not talking about tomorrow, but within the next years, hopefully when the new Metropolitan Opera production in 2020 comes about, they will have this new performance score. But it's a very, very tedious, long process to get this right, and it, you know, we assume it will be right now going forward. Thank you, no pressure. And finally, we have Mike Strunsky. Well, um, I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, Porgy and Bess. Uh, you have far uh, more familiar uh, people, both on this um, on this podium and out there, uh, who have been uh, involved with Porgy and Bess and its intricacies. So since I'm winding up this uh, uh, first part of, of this uh, talk, um, I thought I'd tell you some light stories about Ira, uh, sort of to wind down a little bit uh, on the highly technical uh, stuff that you've heard and which I don't understand. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, light stories and, and uh, uh, please forgive me. Uh, 1932, uh, uh, Ira uh, won the Pulitzer Prize along with George S. Kaufman and Maury Riskin uh, for the show of the icing. And uh, um, uh, my uh, Aunt Emily, who was the first one to uh, get the, uh, the George Gershwin and Strunsky family together, tells me that uh, upon the award to Ira, Ira and George has the only fight, uh, verbal fight, that, uh, that they had during their lifetimes. And that was Ira did not want to accept it because at that time, the Pulitzer Prize was not awarded to a composer. Uh, it was strictly uh, English language. And uh, uh, eventually, because of George's more uh, aggressive personality than Ira, uh, uh, Ira uh, agreed to accept the Pulitzer Prize. He took it home and hung it on the back of his bathroom door. <laughs> and I must say, it remained there until the day of his death. 
I, I uh, visited that bathroom uh, any number of times, <laughs> and uh, always on the way out, uh, was, was faced with a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, I must tell you that I'm very proud uh, to have that Pulitzer Prize, the original, hung over my desk in San Francisco. Um, the next story I want to tell you is uh, about uh, uh, a song that, uh, um, that uh, Ira wrote uh, with, uh, um, uh, or three songs that Ira wrote, uh, which were nominated for Academy Awards. Uh, he, he nominated a song with Harold Arlen, The Man That Got Away. He nominated one with George. Uh, 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 let me go to uh, uh, Jerry Kern first, uh, uh, Long Ago and Far Away. And, and uh, George, they can't take that away from me. To give you some idea of Ira's humor, when all three songs in different years uh, were rejected, or rejected is the wrong word, uh, were not awarded the, Pulitzer, uh, the uh, Academy Award song for that year, Ira said, well, away with away. Because all three songs, believe it or not, had the word away in them. If you, you know, uh, the man that got away, uh, uh, they can't take that away from me, and uh, long ago and far away. I have to tell you a, a, a more personal story, and I hope you will um, accept uh, my, uh, my uh, retelling of it. Um, I had a job in a different world, but it allowed me, because of trips to Los Angeles, to spend a lot of time in the house uh, with, with uh, George, uh, with uh, Ira and, and my father's other sister, uh, Leonor, who he married in 1926. Um, and I arrived at the house about five o'clock, and the first thing that happened was my Aunt Leonor put a, uh, um, a drink in my hand, probably scotch. And, uh, and we sat and talked a lot uh, before dinner. There may have been another scotch. And at dinner, there was some really good wine. And after dinner uh, was a, a glass of brandy. And we talked some more. Ira, by this time, had gone up to his room and um, uh, had done what he always did, and that is read the newspaper with the television set on. Uh, how he did that, I don't know, but he did. So I came in the room, a little unsteadily, and, and uh, uh, somehow or other, uh, the conversation went on, and I turned to Ira and said, uh, Ira, my favorite song of yours was The Man That Got Away. And he knocked his glasses down on his nose and he said, I'll tell you what my favorite song was if you tell me which of your kids is your favorite kid. <laughs> and, and that put me in my place. That put me in my place. So I guess to wind this up, I just have one thing to say. And that is, our love is here to stay. so much. Um, I wish we could be here for like four hours to continue this. We have about 15 minutes for questions, um, either between panel members, um, people in the audience. Does anyone in the panel want to ask each other? I was going to add one thing. Um, someone told us that someone once asked, once asked Ira, which comes first, the music or the words? And Ira said, the contract. <laughs> Can I just add one thing? It's not as humorous as that, but uh, one of you mentioned about Tempe, and that was one thing that I was going to, because that was part of my performance practice and so forth. The same thing has happened to Porgy and Bess, and my pet peeve is summertime, sung as a dirge, instead of at a quarter equals 96, the way it, uh, it's written in the score, and the way we even have a, a recording of George performing it at exactly that tempo. It's not only summer, there are other places I mean, in general. All the slow things have become slower and slower. The duets and the introduction to the uh, second Porgy and Best duet has become, uh, you won't hear it, you'll hear it uh, fast tomorrow night, thank God. But uh, it's, uh, it's just a retributive. It's not a, uh, the, 
it's not the duet yeah. proper. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, you reminded me of another line of Kay's. She said the tempo of the song was its heartbeat. If you slowed it down too much, the song died. I always yeah. remember that. Um, I, I asked Jessica the other day, I said, are they gonna do Lonely Boy? Now, most of you probably don't even know what Lonely Boy is. In the second act, uh, or third act, depending on which way they do it, uh, there is a thing where the um, Bess takes the baby, Clara's baby, and sings a lullaby. It's called Lonely Boy. And in, back in 1935, Ann Brown asked George, could she sing Summertime at that point? So this lovely lullaby, Lonely Boy, was cut so they could be a reprise of Summertime. I've heard Lonely, there was a recording of Lonely Boy, and I've heard it in concert once, but it exists. And most people don't know that there is this other lost, well, semi-lost lullaby. It's a very beautiful piece. Yes. It's short. It was the duet also? It, 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 microphone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This is microphone. Yeah. Can you guys pass the microphone around, yeah. please? Thanks. Uh, this is when uh, Bess, and Serena, you know, Serena who is respectability indeed, church ladiness, uh, it personified in Catfish Row and whereas Bess is the rejected scarlet woman. Uh, and finally Serena accepts Bess as a part of Catfish Row as a tremendously moving. And yet in the show, all Bess has to do is enter with the baby that Clara has given her as she rushes out into the storm and sing summertime with those wonderful chords under it. And that establishes that she's a full member of Catfish Rock. And immediately after that comes uh, Corgi killing Crown. Uh, could I add one more anecdote? Ann Brown uh, told me uh, herself, she was getting up in, in uh, years when she told me this, but it sounds uh, plausible to me that we know that she went, uh, when she was a student at Juilliard, and when George was composing Porgy and Bess, she would go over after school and sing through the music that he had composed that day, supposedly. And she kept saying to him, uh, you know, Bess doesn't have any, she has no solo. All the, everyone else, Sport of Life, Crown, uh, Forgy, everyone has a yeah. Serena, everyone has a solo to sing. And she said, but, and Summertime, she said, Summertime, why, why Clara sings Summertime? I love that song. And George <laughs> said, no, that's not for Bess, that's for Clara, sorry. And one day she came in and George said, I have a surprise for you. I found a place for you to sing Summertime. <laughs> yeah. so great. Let's try to take a few questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? We can go ahead and go over here. Yeah, um, I believe in the Houston production, Archdale, the lawyer, is there. No, Archdale is not the lawyer. Oh. Frazier is the lawyer. Uh, well, Fr Frazier is the African American lawyer. Yeah. There's a white character. Yeah, I'm not sure he's a lawyer, though. Well, Microphone, Wayne? Microphone? Oh, it's not established in the opera that he's a lawyer, okay. and I can't remember the novel he's a, that he's well. He's a lawyer in the novel. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, he, he's the only white character who's sympathetic toward the inhabitants of uh, Catfish Row. I always thought it was unfortunate that in virtually all the productions he's excised. That's my question. And uh, will he appear in the uh, new, new edited version? Uh, the, what the edited version doesn't do is cut anything out. <laughs> that's what, uh, that's, what a, a, um, that, that's what a scholarly edition does. Even if I didn't like it, I wouldn't <laughs> cut it out. And I should tell you uh, that for things that are not sensitive, my, my own, uh, um, my own password is Archdale. 
Now he has to change no, his password. We, we don't know, quite honestly, uh, future productions of Porgy and Bess. It's still up to the music director and the director to make their cuts because, I mean, they still have, you know, their three hours or whatever, they have three hours, 15 minutes, plus their intermissions to do everything. So we don't know quite what, what, is, what you're going to see when it's finally done in performance with this new, you know, new addition. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if it gives the idea that there is uh, no, that operas shouldn't be cut. You have never heard in act four of the marriage of Figaro, Marcellina give her, uh, give her aria about the goat. I won't get into goats and Porgy and Bess. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Verdi pleaded when, um, when Trovatore was first done in Paris, for God's sake, don't do the big uh, showy uh, cabaletta after the, uh, after the Miserere scene, because he realized that, that it steps on one of the great scenes in opera. Uh, I have nothing against Porgy and Bess being performed with cuts. I, I would hate to see Archdale cut, but the cuts are fine. Uh, you, you have to do them sometimes. Uh, one of the things I did in the edition is uh, document what cuts were made in the first production and the cut that Ira recommended, and boy do I recommend it, uh, um, for the first revival. Yeah, but in an addition, if you cut something, it becomes the gem that was left out, and people get sincere about it. You know, if Titus Andronicus had never been published in the Shakespeare folios, everyone would think of it as the great lost Shakespeare play. I have to say that I'm. Kind of, I mean, we have to make cuts, otherwise, there's over three hours, approximately three hours of music, without any intermission. And uh, most productions uh, are timed that they come in uh, slightly under three hours. So you have to cut uh, considerable with one intermission. If you do th uh, the entire show, like the Metropolitan Opera did uh, the last time, you have to have two intermissions, and then you end up with over four hours, as I recall. Yeah, and people dash towards the, the bar uh, when they do have an <laughs> intermission. <laughs> My problem with cuts is that every time I go, we go out, I change the cuts because I'm never happy with the cuts and I always miss what I had cut the last time and, and want to put it back in. And for that I have to cut something else. <laughs> oh, yes. oh yeah. So let's go ahead and take one more question. Um, Ma'am, you had a question. Several years ago, uh, there was a wonderful PBS a production of Porgy and Bess um, supported by the Gershwin Foundation. How will this differ, to, you know, um, tomorrow night in the in the production? It was, I loved it. Well, this is stand up and sing, you know, and from that, uh, for for one thing, Porgy is not going to be on his knees uh, for for this production. Although I guess now he's just with a tends to be just with a couple of crutches. Uh, it, it's 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 different. You know, stand up and sing is one thing, and a uh, production that that is actually staged is another. Uh, this is a read through. This is a read through. We we hope we pray not to find things that we say, oh dear, we should have done something else. And I think through rehearsals we haven't found that. Uh, but uh, if you want the full Forty and best experience. Uh, you won't have all of that, but you'll have, you'll get a lot. It's beautiful singing, yeah. and all, yes. And it will be long, because it is uncut. You are now warned. <laughs> I want to say something about what was just said a few minutes ago about uh, the change in the policeman's uh, discussion discussion is the wrong word, the policeman's dialogue. Um, that was changed for political reasons and not for artistic reasons. And uh, we can talk about that at greater length another time. Yeah. Uh, actually, that's the first, well, I, I wasn't talking about that particular aspect. I was just talking about d 
did not versus didn't. Uh, yeah, uh, we are on the same page <laughs> for, the, for those changes. And we have time for one last question. I see someone far in the back there. Oh, I was just going to ask in this microphone. Time microphone, just a moment. Microphone coming. In this timeline, it says in 1920, George wrote his first blues song. I was wondering, what is that song? Where is it? Can I hear it? Please tell me. Um, let's give Rich a microphone. <laughs> It's, um, it's in the, um, one of the, I, th I think it's in the Scandals of, of 1920. Uh, on my, uh, uh, yeah, on my yada da, <laughs> for all my, on my mind for all night long. And the whole, no. Okay. All night on on my mind all night long, and that's the name of it. It it's it uh, it uses the word blues. It is not uh, loaded with blue notes, but um, when, when it appeared in a roll version, a piano roll version, it was called a blues song. Um, it, and it, it is a, a song of, of a, a, a very rare, actually, at that time in those, uh, in, in those circles, in, in Broadway circles, you have very, it, 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 bl blues are just filtering up from the southern <clears throat> um, ba folk background at, around that time, and it's, I think right about in certainly in the year right around 1920, when the uh, it becomes blues blues songs really start showing up in in profusion right around that time. I think it was 21 when uh, Jerome Kern sent uh, for one of his shows a. A, blong, uh, a, a blues song in, in which the, it's a full, the, the refrains are full 12 bar choruses with the, with the harmonic uh, idea. Uh, the, 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 the structure, the, the harmonic structure is what, what goes on there. I, I, I'm, I can't remember the name of, the, of that song by Kern, but by that time it's starting to get in. But th this song from, from, from uh, Gershwin is, uh, it's a mournful song. Uh, just a, this is a parenthesis, but it's kind of fun. Uh, in about 1912, when St. Louis Blues was published by Andy, people suddenly saw that blues were the things to do, so Many uh, sheet music sales people would get themselves a rubber stamp. They'd go through all the blues, 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 blues. <laughs> yeah. Now we're doing this, I should say that I counted all the Bessie Smith uh, songs, and the songs that are titled the Such and Such Blues, uh, only about half of them. Our 12 bar high flutes. Uh, you know, it. Uh, you are not. Uh, you are not somebody who doesn't know what he or she is talking about. If you call something a blues in this, like 12 bar blues. Well, so unfortunately, oh, I'm okay. sorry, Wayne. It's waiting for the end of the sentence. Unfortunately, we have to cut this short so we can move on. We have so much knowledge up here, and I'm so thankful. Um, for this entire panel, and thankfully they will be here off and on throughout the day. So if you have questions, um, they they are founts of knowledge. So let's thank our panel. Um,